How are you this morning? Me? I'm doing yes, great. You. Okay, good. Yes, you. Uh, well caffeinated. Okay, that's that's good. Well, it's always good to have my speaker here 10 minutes early, so. <laughs> So I've got, I see you've got your library behind you. I have you beat. I have the Library of Alexandria as my background. So we're... That's going to be a tough one to beat. Yeah. I well, don't have a single scroll or codex back here. I know. I need mean, the codexes are here in the top row. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then scroll. Although I've, I've got the slight advantage that my library is real. That's true. Well, mine was real at one time. <laughs> yeah, that's really true. my head. <laughs> well, Brother uh, Brian uh, Croto, who's our district deputy for the research lodges, had his his background looked like one of those fake backgrounds, but it was actually mm -hmm. his office, and he had the Dewey Decimal System that he did himself. So I said, "Well, I will have to one up you somehow." So I went looking for a picture of the uh, artist conception of the Library of Alexandria. So, so there you go. I've got I've got a whole bunch of other stuff like down out of sight, but um, yeah. including uh, so I have this comic book version of the Bible from the 1980s. OK. And uh, it looks like uh, it looks kind of like this. And oh, yeah. Stories from, you know, I've seen so those. Yeah. I got this when I was like eight, probably. Right. And uh you know, I have more proper ones in here too. And then a bunch of stuff like morals and dogma and like a lot of right. classic stuff, but um, there's a whole bunch low down here. That's kind of out of sight. Well, you actually have room for Chachki on your bookshelves. I yeah. Not. <laughs> well, so I have a job that has me doing a lot of presentations. I've also got a couple of fake ones. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I have a job that has me doing a lot of presentations for lots of people. Right. And so it helps to have something like a reasonably staged background to keep it a, like a little bit visually, visually interesting, I guess. Yep. Um, but uh, like a Masonic audience might be able to spot morals and dogma in the background. Nobody else ever does. Right. Yeah. Well, I have plenty of, um, let's see. I have plenty of, um, books i only show there's one bookshelf there but i've got and i can pick up the camera and show you i have there there and mm -hmm. that there <laughs> but i have i have no um wall space no exposed wall space in my office it's all just about all taken up we're, we're supposed to be redoing it at some point but it's almost all shelves and i want to have some actual exposed areas so i can hang up some of my you know my i love me wall again so I haven't had it here in 10 years and <laughs> I have lots of things to hang on the walls <coughs> and nowhere to hang them. So, yeah, but I do like having actual books and I've read most of them in here, or at least half. <coughs> yeah. There's always new ones coming out. So mm -hmm. uh, Christopher, I don't know if you're aware of this one. I just got this like a week ago. This was written by the grand master of uh, North Carolina in 2020. Oh, cool. Right. Um, so this is basically about, um, uh, so the Grandmaster in 2020 was this guy named Sean Bradshaw, and uh, they created a program for all of North Carolina called the Middle Chamber Program for Masonic Education. And this oh, book cool. is basically about what they did and how they did it and what the curriculum was and the operational aspects of how they made it happen and all that good stuff. I like um, that idea. Yeah, it's... um. So far, it, it's pretty good. The, the other guy that wrote this, I think, is... is uh, brother named Ben Wallace, okay. who I have not met. Um, but yeah, recommended. That's cool that they go to that effort. We do have the Masonic, uh, what is it? The Masonic University that they've started up here. The Grand Lodge is starting. I know a few people on it. On they the do. Can, can, you, yeah. uh, can, can you share a link to wherever that is? or how? Yeah. Um, actually, I put it, I think I put it on the... Uh, no, I didn't. I, I had it in the paper, but I cut it out. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll share it on the, on the group. They're, they're still putting it together. Their, their web page is not fully set up yet. But the idea is they are actually moving towards having some formal 
education process going on, which is cool because we've been neglectful at the Grand Lodge level to have something like if your lodge isn't doing something about Masonic education, you really can't go to the Grand Lodge and say, okay, I want to do this. Where do I go? And other than the research lodges, yeah. I don't see there's a there's a clear path. And I'm really hoping yeah. this article I wrote uh, based on two meetings ago here uh, where I interviewed all the district deputies. Morning, John Hughes. Good to see you, sir. Um, it's, uh, it, is, it was an opportunity to interview all the other um, research lodges. And it was great to, to get their history. There's stuff I didn't know. That, that they covered and hopefully that being an article in the Masonic Herald will expose us to more brothers who don't know about the research lodges because we don't do enough to promote them and the Grand Lodge doesn't do enough to promote us so it's kind of like we we need to step up and promote ourselves more and push Masonic education yeah. more and, and that's kind of one thing that I've always noticed is ritual at least in Virginia I can't speak for other Grand Lodges but ritual is well codified and established there's a district instructor of work every junior warden has to pass a certificate has to get a certificate in the ritual they have ritual schools all over the place so it's getting masonic ritual right is not hard and that's very much attended to by the grand lodge there's a district educational officer for every district most lodges in theory have an leo but there is no formal program it's like yeah, masters yeah. are encouraged get the DEO to come give a talk. That's it. That's not, that's you know there's no there's not a structure in place actively pushing Masonic education other than a few people talking about it from time to time. So yeah. I think that's something we need to address. Yeah. But I mean I'm reaching more people in other states and other countries than I'm reaching here in Virginia. It with this. So, you know, hopefully I'm reaching more Virginia brothers along the way. But, you know, uh, it's easier to connect with people in other countries. So, And Alan is driving in uh, South Dakota right now. Good to have you with us. <laughs> he's got the top down and he's. <laughs> is that is that actually a steering wheel? He's got that. Yeah, I, I was saying Alan's got the top down and he's got uh, Mount Rushmore in the back. And so he's driving away, but he's not driving very fast. Yeah, that's, he is in his vehicle. And he starts putting up these backgrounds. Good to have you with us, Brother Clark. <laughs> and you're on mute. There we go. How you doing, Worshipful? All right. Good to have you with us, as always. I'm so are you be just out always... of the truck for I'm going to be out of the truck for a couple of minutes getting fuel, but I'll probably okay. be back before the meeting starts. Great. Okay. Are you Otherwise, always on the road, can... or are you just always on the road on Saturdays? <laughs> I'm supposed to be home two days a month. Okay. My, by my choice. And uh, last month it was two weeks. Uh, I'll be home in another hour today. Okay. Very good. Well, we appreciate you yep. making this part of your ride. <laughs> I'll be back in a little bit. Right. Brother Bird, how are you this morning? Do, doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. Yeah, I'm. I'm also right now. <laughs> oh, okay. And where are you coming from? Um, I'm in upstate New York, just outside of Syracuse. Oh, okay. Well, nice to have you with us today. Let's see. We're right at ten. Uh, as always, I never know how many people to expect. Um, so it's kind of like hard to know when to start uh, the official thing, but. I want to welcome everyone uh, to our uh, unstated meeting of Virginia Research Lodge. Uh, my name is Chris Douglas. I am your host. I'm the junior warden of our lodge, and I'm posting here in the uh, in the chat. Uh, some of this is for you guys sitting here. Some of this is for people on YouTube who are going to watch this later. Uh, but of course, we don't have the links on YouTube. But that's you know. Well, then you need to attend if you want to see the link. So there. Uh, we have our Facebook page. Most of you all are familiar with our group. Uh, we do have the Research Lodge website, and uh, I guess at some point I could actually put the links in the video if I want to work that hard. Maybe I should. Um, our website is where you can um, see all of our research papers that we have published so far from our archives and from the other uh, four research lodges in Virginia. Then our um, YouTube channel, where all these unstated meetings are. Um, 
going to be posted. I just posted the one on Swedish masonry um, earlier this week. So I was a little behind on that. I try to get it done within a week for y'all. And then my email address. Uh, so if you're interested in signing up for our weekly research papers, if you're not already, um, you can message me on Facebook or send me an email. We'd love to add you to the mailing list. So, um, so we have seven of us so far. I don't know who else uh, is planning to come. I never know how big an audience we're going to have. So never quite sure when to really kick things off for you all. Um, but uh, let's see. Uh, Brother Hughes, anything going on with you? What's going on in England right now? Anything exciting? Uh, not just at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I've got a couple of big meetings coming up. I've just, just had one of my meetings Thursday night. So we had a candidate. But... Okay. I can, I can barely hear you. Your mic's kind of quiet. <clears throat> I um I did want to go ahead and read something if I could. <clears throat> I always try to have something different in our um, presentations before we get to the speaker. Sometimes I'll ask a question, but something that came to me at four in the morning. <laughs> On uh, one day, I got up early and couldn't get back to sleep and something, I responded to something. I really like social media. I mean, it's, it's. It, I mean, at times it's a cesspool, but it's our cesspool. And uh, <laughs> I try and comment on things, you know, political things come up or Masonic things come up and I comment on them. And then sometimes I see something and it inspires me to sit down and actually write out something longer on it and um one sec. You're good, you're good, you're good, you're one good. second all right and back okay um this is something that i i gave a response i'm gonna pull this in front of me so i look at the camera when i'm talking um this is a response to something someone had posted and it made me think I need to um, go ahead and <clears throat> write it all out. It's, it's only a minute or two here, but uh, I might turn it into a full fledged paper later because it's an interesting idea. But it's called Your Lodge Dues Are Not a Movie Ticket. <clears throat> Going to the movies can be a fun and even magical experience. You buy a ticket and for around two hours you're entertained, maybe even uplifted. Add in the overpriced food or drink from the concession stand, and that's the extent of your commitment. You paid a little bit of money and were rewarded with a little bit of entertainment for your afternoon. But I think too many brothers treat masonry like a movie theater. They think the cost of admission is their annual dues. They paid some money up front for the degrees, some time invested in learning a catechism, if at all, and then write a check once a year for dues. They have met their obligation. Quite a bargain, they think. For the cost of a dinner out once a month, they get regular entertainment and enlightenment or just the privilege of wearing a ring and telling people they are a Freemason without even the need to go back to lodge. After all, wearing that suit is such a bother. Why can't we just be more casual? But they will be wrong. The dues are just enough to pay to keep the lights on, to give us a place to meet. That paltry sum in no way pays for the experience you just received, not even close. In order to provide for you a single night's experience, whether it's a degree, a stated meeting, or a dinner, took work and dedication from a dozen or more brothers. And the only way to pay that back is to put in the work yourself. Freemasonry is paid for those who donate their time and talents to make a memorable experience. The brothers who spend hours learning a ritual part, and even more hours rehearsing together to make that degree come alive. The brothers who pay the bills, who run the meetings, who sweep and mop and vacuum and wax the floors, who change the light bulbs, who prepare the meals, who serve the meals, who wash the dishes, who set up and tear down the lodge after each meeting, who write the speeches, who repair the building when it needs a little TLC. Every evening you experience at your lodge was only possible because a lot of men worked hard to provide that experience for you. Ours is a working organization. It is incumbent on you, my brother, to donate your time and talents to the lodge whatever they may be, to ensure the experience for the next new member. 
and all of the current ones is just as memorable as your experience was and maybe even better. If every single Mason would donate just a little bit of his time, who took his natural born abilities and donated them to his lodge in sweat equity, if every single one of us would put in the work equally, just think how much we would accomplish. So, that was just a little something I wrote the other day. I was getting a lot of positive feedback. I put it out on a couple of Masonic channels and people asked if they could share it in their lodge and stuff. And it's just a short thing. Morning, Michael. You missed it. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a, um, it was just a short piece. I and mean, it was probably what about a minute to read, but uh, it was some idea that just came to me and just wanted to write it down and put it out there. So um <clears throat> I think it's important. I think we just, we take, you know, I, don't know, I kind of speaks for itself. Michael, you missed my little talk on uh, masonry is more than a movie ticket. I think you might have read that. I was standing here resting for the longest time. Yes, I know. <laughs> well, I, I was reading and I came back. My co-host is in here, so I couldn't admit you. So I don't know when you came on, how long you're waiting in the waiting room there. Anyway, any thoughts on that? Talk, any questions, any ideas you want, you all want to share? Well, um, the, I guess the, the thought that I have is, you know, movie ticket is kind of a metaphor for you expect to pay for something and you expect to get something like it's a commercial transaction. Exactly. And I think it kind of circles around, um, you know, the trite old thing that a past master might tell me at some point is, well, you really get out of it what you put into it. And um, increasingly, like that, that, that's shown itself to be more true as time goes on. Um, but basically, like masonry becomes a vehicle for you to do what you need to do and for you to get what you need. It, it, it's not a vending machine that provides what you need, <laughs> you right. know? Um, I, I think that a lot of brothers that I have met are a little bit blocked in the sense that if they don't yet have clarity what it is that they're looking for, it, it's hard, to, you know, it's, it's very uh, alluring to assume that somebody's just going to give it to you. You know what I mean? Sure. Because you literally don't know how to go get it yourself. Right. Well, yeah, that, that's true. We need to make it easier for people to find the way. I mean, a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of what you get out of masonry, you have to put in the effort on yourself to learn more. You're going to, you're always going to learn more. If you're only relying on your lodge to provide your Masonic education, you're not going to get enough. But at a minimum, every lodge should be providing Masonic education. So at least the least hardworking brothers among us will at least get some Masonic education. But there are those that say, well, you know, I can't, I, if I tell you, you can't learn. Is that we, we have to help people put people on the way. I mean, we're trying, I'm trying with this platform to expose people to different ideas and hopefully on their own they'll go read more about alchemy they'll go read more about the Swedish right I'm, I'm at least I'm trying to find as eclectic and esoteric a topics as I can to get introduce some of you all the things that especially things that I didn't know anything about and um, I finally got someone to come and talk about the Kabbalah which is cool because I don't know enough about that and it, it's you know if if Watching a program in a lodge or watching one of our shows, one of our videos gives you <clears throat> just enough of an interest to go and read more on your own, then that's great. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be stimulating the minds to go and do more research on your own. But we can't just say masonry, Masonic education is completely a solo endeavor. Well, no, that's the whole reason we come together. You know, we come together and we share what we know. Uh, but on a similar topic to that post, I had something a week or two earlier about Masons, not basically everyone chipping in. And uh, yeah, because someone made a post about what something about, you know, working in the lodge or something. And I replied about how so many, you know, every new member, we need to find them something to do. And this one brother complained and said, you know, I don't join the Scottish Rite to work. You're just giving people more work. I came here to enjoy myself. I came here, you know, to be entertained and to learn something. Why are you expecting me to work? I was like, seriously? So I politely wrote back to him. I hope I was polite. Uh, he didn't ever respond. But I said, look, kind of in the vein of what I just said here, it's like 
whatever you go to lodge or Scottish Rite, you go to see a degree, there's 10 or more men who sat down for several hours and rehearsed their parts and learned their parts and practiced together to give you that degree. Everyone in every Masonic body is obligated to contribute something. If you're just showing up, I guess it was kind of a precursor to me writing this, talking to that guy. But it was like, if everyone just expects you to show up and you just get entertained, someone's got to put in the effort for you. And it's often the same five guys in every valley or lodge or chapter. It's the same five guys who get everything done and they get all the work because they get it done and then they get burned out. So again, if every single one of us would show up and say, hey, I don't know much, but I know how to do this. How can I use this to help the lodge? I mean, think about it. There was a time when um, lodges were filled with more operative type masons. We had electricians and plumbers and carpenters. I'm sure we still do to some point. And, you know, if something needed to be fixed in the lodge, you didn't go and hire a plumber. You had a member of the lodge who is a plumber who would fix the stuff, you know, at cost. He'd, he'd get reimbursed for the materials, but he'd donate his time. So the lodge didn't have to pay a professional. But, you know, every one of us can contribute something to the lodge, regardless of what it, whatever your talents are, find what they are and figure out how can I donate my time to the lodge? How can I take my natural talents, something I'm naturally good at, and give of that of myself and make my lodge better? And if we all thought about it that way, we, our lodges would be amazing. We, we, we have every need net. We'd be constantly doing cool things. Imagine if you're like, say you're a, a, a retirement is specialist, you know, you, 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 your, your job is how to manage retirement funds. And you gave a short talk in your lodge on how to kind of put your finances in order. It's not Masonic, but it definitely will be a benefit to all of the members. And just sharing that with people might, would help along. And that's given of your talents. So anyway, uh, welcome brother a day. Nice to have you with us. Um, Anyone else have anything before I get to our speaker? Uh, one, com <clears throat> one comment on what you were talking about. Please. One of the things I've learned in uh, being a Boy Scout leader for a number of years uh, as a volunteer in different positions is that even if you give somebody something, how, however little it is, it may be calling, keeping track of a couple of people who are sick or something like that, uh, gives them a sense of ownership. This is and true. A corporation. <clears throat> yes, they're invested. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. There's there's many reasons to do it, but yes, that's one as well. If I if I give you a job, you're not just some guy showing up paying dues. You, you're you're essential. You're you're the guy who calls people when they're sick. You, you feel <clears throat> or you're just one person, or yeah. just one person, just something small. Right. Start but there. You're doing something, and you feel like if you don't show up and do it, it's not getting done. Right. So you have an ob you're obligating yourself to come back and keep doing that thing, whatever it is. Yes, that's very true. I don't know. I, I mean, we all, I mean, I'm touching on things that I'm sure all of us have heard, but um, it's a constant refrain in masonry. It's like, you know, we're bringing in members and they're not staying active or they're debating within a couple of years. And I've read a lot of, watched a lot of podcasts recently and read a lot of, from people and, um, the biggest misconception I think is we just assume, I used to assume this when it was true back in the nineties and the eighties when it started, but all of these Masons who came in, in the 1940s, right. And fifties, right after world war II, we had a huge swell in the ranks and we were building big lot. We were chartering new lodges and building buildings. And, you know, all of these Masons came in and everything is built on the concept of how many members we were bringing in then. And now, because most of the 60s generation didn't come in, well, we're seeing all of those older members dying off, and that's why masonry membership is going down. That may have been true, but in the last 20 years or so, honestly, most of the World War II vets are dead by now. But in the last 20 years, it's not death that's reducing our ranks. It's new members who stay less than three years and either just demit or get suspended for non-payment of dues. They just stop coming. They just stop paying their dues and we have to suspend them. And that's what's, that's what's cutting our numbers. 
we are not taking new members and giving them a reason to stick around. We have no trouble, I think. We have no trouble bringing in new members. I think we're all very good at bringing in new members into our lodges. Our biggest problem is giving them some incentive to hang around more than three years. And that's where the depletion in the ranks is coming from, is NPDs and demits. And usually, the, I mean, I've seen the stats here for different Grand Lodges, and it's, it's staggered how much of them are within the first three years. If a guy's going to quit masonry, he's going to quit in the first handful of years. So logically, if you want to keep them around, you've got to get them invested right away, give them something to do, and they'll hang around for life. And it's, it's, it's pretty obvious. And we're simply not doing that. So. <clears throat> you All know, Chris, right. one of the Go things ahead, that I say, Please. yeah, one of the things that I say when I do a DEO visit is that if you want people to come back to your lives, the first thing you don't want to hear is let's hurry up and get this over with, you know, yes. from the sec secretary. And, and likewise, I mean, who really wants to come to a meeting every week where you do nothing but read the bills, uh, read the green lodge notices, and then, uh, Talk about the uh, you know the blood supply you know the blood donors and 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 then right. just say all right brother have you anything else you know is any brother anything else to offer and then go home I think that's you know not interesting meetings as a chief factor and people you know not coming back absolutely and that goes back to Masonic education even okay the thing I just read that I wrote myself in at four mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning I, I guess I need to get up every morning at four and write because I seem to do better when I write. <laughs> Because that all came out in like five minutes, just typing away. Um, but even something short like that, that's like two minutes, you know, is going to grab your attention. It's going to make you think. It doesn't have to be. I think it would be wonderful if every single lodge had a 10 to 15 minute research paper at every meeting. I think that would be great. But I don't think the members are ready for that in most lodges. So we got to ease that in. That should be a regular occurrence several times a year. Um, ideally, um, every lot should have that, but have some short talk on something. That's a good name for a group, Mike. What do you think? A short talk. We should have an organization that does short talk. Does that yeah, we could, we could put them all together into like some sort of a printed pamphlet. We could call it yes. like uh, the short the talk. Short talk printed something, pamphlet. yeah, brief, brief exposés. Brief, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's probably heard of the short talk bulletin. That's what I'm joking about. But yeah, uh, honestly, short talk bulletins, they used to send them to everybody. I don't know if I just got them because I was an, a, a, a stationed officer and that's why I stopped getting them, or maybe they just stopped. They were sending them to everybody at one time, I thought, but I think they only send them to, they send like one to the secretary now. I don't believe that um, the Masonic Service Association sends them to everyone like they used to. But I think each lodge at least gets one every month. So yeah, the, se the secretaries get them, I believe. Like I, I, I never even got the option to receive one when I was raised. Um, I suppose I could probably chase it down on the website and manually subscribe like any other magazine. Yep. But right. as far as I know, it wasn't an option. Yeah, I, I do recall getting them. I think when I was master the first time, this was back in the mid 90s. I think I was as junior and senior warrant as master. I got a copy. So it might have been the program then that they sent it to station officers. But I know they just stopped coming. So, <clears throat> but um, I get them as DEO. What's that? You get them I, as DEO. I get it. Every okay. Month. So yeah, I mean the short talks, but they're certainly accessible. So any master or secretary should at least have someone read the short talk. I mean, even if you have no program planned, ask one of the past masters to stand up and read it in advance. Read the short talk bulletin to everyone. That's at least something. Every lot should have one. I mean, all of us, I think most in this room, well, maybe most of you probably had the past master's degree. Um, you're, you're charged to um, give a lecture or some portion thereof in before closing your lodge. And that's anything that's Masonic education, either ritual or Masonic education. You're supposed to be doing something in every meeting <clears throat> to advance education. So we should. <laughs> I mean, we're on the we're on the opposite end of the spectrum. We're in the research lodges. We go we go several times a year and have all the research papers we can stand. We do them twice a month here, but I think every lodge needs that. I and mean, that's the thing. We're kind of we're we're like at one end of the pool, and we're like saturated in Masonic education and research, and that's what we're doing. And that's great. We need to diffuse that out to the rest of masonry, 
and get all of them to have a little bit of Masonic education at every meeting. I think that would greatly improve our uh, our lodges and improve attention. Face it, if you go to a meeting, you know, you heard a five minute talk on something interesting that would satisfy you, Mike. You know, you'd be like, okay, I heard I heard something of interest, something I hadn't thought of that was cool, and you go home thinking about that. So we definitely need to get drive that point home. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and present our speaker, uh, Brother Allen. I don't even know if you're a past master or not. I just said you was brother is always an appropriate title, but I'll let him introduce himself and explain where this paper came from. I touched on it earlier, but um, sure. I'm going to present Brother M. David Allen, who is our guest speaker today. Uh, could you enable screen sharing for yes, me? Yes, sorry. I meant to do that. Um, so my, my name is David Allen. Um, I use my there first initial because there's so many David Allens out there. Uh, I'm a Master Mason at Richmond Randolph 19. I have no titles whatsoever. I've never sat in an officer's chair, never been a worshipful master. I'm just some guy. Okay. So as we go through this today, um, let me see if I can find the right one. I'm not going to be able to see you, but you can see me. And um, I, I like a very uh, interactive kind of style. So as we're talking through this, uh, don't ask to ask, just shout out your question. Let's talk about it as we go through. So the way that I came to this and the reason I wrote the paper in the first place is I'm going through a education program as part of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction called the College of the Consistory. And it has you write papers about each and every degree as you go. And I wrote a kind of a longer one on the fourth degree and in particular the, the, the secrecy stuff and the, the idea of practicing silence in the fourth degree. This isn't really a Scottish Rite presentation though. As we see, we're gonna be talking mostly about Blue Ledge Con Lodge concepts I'm going to refer back to obligations and ritual, but we're not going to be giving anything away. Uh, another way that I approach this is that I see a really, really strong negative slant towards secrecy in the modern world. Secrecy is not good and very, very poorly thought of. Um, finally, for me personally, when I got raised, I thought that there was this thing that I called the secrecy puzzle. So we know that Freemasonry has secrets. Um, but what on earth does that mean if you can read them online? Uh, you know, we say, well, you, you don't necessarily know where the right ones are. You can't tell the good from bad and all of that's true. But generally, this stuff is online. Um, but past masters will tell you, well, I mean, come on, it's not that simple. That's not really all there is to it. And then you think a little bit deeper. Well, there's mysteries and there's secrets and they're called out differently in the ritual. And then you add all that up. And, and as a newly raised Master Mason, you say, wait, what on earth is going on? What, what, what are the secrets? What, what's the list of them? What does it mean for something to be secret? What's the relevance of all of this? And so I, I went down this path of, of writing this and doing the research to try to put answers to that. You guys can judge today how well or how poorly I did that. But before, before we get into the different types of secrecy, I want to make a case against secrecy about why it's so negative, wrong, bad, and harmful, because we can't understand how secrecy and Freemasonry operates in the 21st century without understanding the surround, without understanding the surrounding culture. So I consider secrecy to be a pretty serious uh, deviation from the social norms that we see in 2022, where we value transparency. Um, one of the reasons that we value transparency, aside from technology, is that our overall level of trust in society is extremely low. We've got really hardcore us versus them camps set up in society. We're not going to be talking about politics at all today. I just want to observe the fact that there are multiple camps out there that really, really dislike each other and are extremely suspicious of one another. And this is more reason for society to value transparency. Now, technology has been heavily involved in this. Like it's never been easier to become transparent. Um, we can write and share things globally in seconds. And so, you know, the, the, the difficulty of providing transparency to somebody else can never be used as an excuse to retain um, a secret. Um, furthermore, we see this actually with anti-masonry online, that whenever there's a lack of information about something or an information gap, all of the wags come out of the woodwork and they basically substitute their own information in to fill in the blanks. Okay, so secrecy, for all of these reasons, I would consider it a pretty strong deviation from how the culture operates in 2022. We also have this really, really long, firm um, 
uh, a tradition in society about secrecy being bad. So uh, a Supreme Court justice says that sunlight is, is said to be the best of all disinfectants. And in our public officials, for example, secrecy is very bad because it's the key way that bad actors evade accountability for their, for their misdeeds. Um, if you have a chance to check it out at some at point, there's this book, The Transparent Society by David Brin. I'm going to give you just a really rapid summary. What he's really talking about is you have all the surveillance that's going on and everybody's thoughts, deeds and actions are transparent, whether it's because they post videos of themselves online or whether it's because giant data companies are aggregating data about them. So David Brin makes the argument this is completely inevitable. Don't even bother trying to stop it. What he wants to do is basically turn that transparency on the people who control the power, as in like, you need that same transparency out of your police, your courts, your judges, and your government, because one-way transparency where they can see you, but you can see them is not a good thing. And so in all of this cultural discussion, right, we're driving towards more and more and more transparency over time, deepening where that transparency occurs, and secrecy is just anathema to the whole thing. And so this is part of the puzzle to me about secrecy and Freemasonry is to what extent is it good? Well, we're going to try to break that down today. And in order to do it, we have to kind of chop up secrecy a little bit. And we're going to deal with it in three sections in this presentation. The first is secrecy about issues of identity and personal secrets. The second is secrecy about relationships between people. And then the third, we're going to talk about esoteric secrecy and some of the, the deeper meanings of symbolism and ritual for Freemasonry. And this kind of maps to this, this graphic at the bottom is from the Masonic Legacy Society. And they often speak explicitly about the lodge having three different layers of meetings. And so the internal lodge is basically what's going on between your ears. Uh, the external lodge is what we normally think of when we talk about a lodge. My, my external lodge is Richmond Randolph 19. And then the universal lodge is basically all of mankind. And we hear this in the charge at the end of a master mason's lodge all the time. Um, these generous principles are extent or to extend further that 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 kind of bit. So let's take this in sections: identity, relationship, and esoteric. So first up is personal secrecy. Um, one thing that hits you in the face when you look at the research, and it's going to be pretty clear if you think about your own life, is that you can't self determine your own life without secrecy. So some of the biggest secrets about people deal with their personal identity. And so you might be trying to transform your identity or you might be trying to protect your identity. If you're trying to transform your, your identity, your, your, your wife, for example, might be going from partner to mother. Okay. Um, there might be issues of sexual intimacy or death. So like a person's chronic illness, for example, that is likely to result in their death in the next six months is often a big family secret. Um, mourning for somebody who has been lost and also a religious conversion. If you read books or you know friends who have gone through a religious conversion process, that is an ex extremely fraught time um, because a person is literally losing one identity. For example, maybe they're going from agnostic and then they're becoming a Buddhist or a person is losing footloose, fancy free mid twenties, and they're going to settle down and now they're going to become a father. And this is going to be just a completely new identity for them. Um, sometimes an identity isn't changing or transforming, but you need to protect what that identity is. And so that might deal with uh, secrets about sexual orientation and people being in the closet. It might, maybe you're a government whistleblower and you have released information about misdeeds and you don't want to be persecuted for that. And it may deal with things like gender identity as well. In either case, it's about either transforming or protecting identity. Now, in the Master Mason's obligation, there is a bit about this, about keeping the secrets. And I think that most brothers kind of understand that bit of the master Mason's obligation on this level. Like maybe a brother's going to confide in you and say that he's having trouble with his wife and he doesn't know if this relationship can, can continue. And you should keep that secret for him because that's part of his identity and how he self-determines his life. Um, when we talk about the secrecy thing, though, we're kind of forced to confront that basically everybody's wearing a mask, including with basic pleasantries. I mean, how many times have you been 
you know, low on sleep or in a really bad mood and somebody says, hey, how you doing? You say, hey, I'm pretty good. How are you doing? And I mean, that's just a basic pleasantry. You don't need to go into what all of your issues and problems are every time. And you might present a strong face of you're feeling great and everything's fine. Um, this is part of how you maintain your identity in front of a group of other people. So one of the quotes that I got out of one of my um, sources deals with this. The main secret is not that of one's true identity, but that, no, that one has no identity other than the protective and intrusive set of performances that is one's battle armor. Let me pause on that a second. A lot of us have identities where we're operating in the Masonic circle and acting in one way. And then, for example, at work, we're not talking about masonry all the time. We may have a very different identity at work, okay? This isn't necessarily a harmful secret, but it's hard, part of how we present ourselves to the world. So if you're able to protect your identity, you're also going to need some protection for your plans and actions. And so if you want to move from one identity to the next, like, for example, from married guy to father, you're going to need plans and actions. Um, you might need to change your business or your career, or you might need to elope. And so there are really good reasons why you might keep those kinds of secrets. Um, and it's all about your right as an individual to guard and protect your identity. Um, there's a lot of other situations that require secrecy of plans and actions. I've got a couple of examples here. Um, and, you know, in some of the reading that I did, it's like, imagine... Uh, this idea of oppressive transparency. If transparency goes too far, how boring would a chess game be where each grandmaster is pre-announcing what their moves are and there's no unpredictability or surprise whatsoever. Everyone is just reacting to what the other one did along the lines of, of, of book knowledge. And so there, there's a lot of advantages too where an artist might be able to try something out and risk failing or embarrassing him or herself, but try that out privacy, privately and uh, keep that art project a secret. And so all of these kinds of things, people's ability to protect their plans and actions with secrets provides benefit to society in the way of art, innovation, diplomacy, and certain kinds of justice. Diplomacy was another interesting example I ran across frequently um, where diplomats need the ability to operate in secret um, so that they can float trial balloons to kind of feel out what the other person's negotiating position is going to be so that they can get to agreements, particularly when there's a lot of hostile and contentious voices in the room. Um, before I go on to relationship secrecy, does anybody have any comments or thoughts or questions that they want to ask about the personal side? Okay. So on the relationship secrecy side, uh, secrecy is crucial to the subjectivity and the structuring of society, since both the individual sense of self and individual's ability to interact sanely and respectfully with one another are reliant on people's capacity to withhold information about themselves. Both people are not looking too closely and politely pretending that they do not know half as much about other people as they actually do. <laughs> this is another reference that I pulled out of the reading that's, that's actually kind of deep. If you think about this, you're going to find it to be true of your brothers in your lodge and also of a lot of other people that you know in your private life. Um, this isn't a negative thing. People aren't you know, being false with one, with one another, but this is literally woven into the structure of polite society. Um, that led me to a lot of research about the process of how human beings develop and mature intimacy with one another. Um, and it reminded me of the Masonic secretary's duty. Um, and there's this line that always stuck in my head, keep a just and true record of all things proper to be written. Well, what on earth is proper to be written? Well, that's a judgment call. Within a lodge, we might have a discussion about a brother who's fallen on hard times and a lot of the specifics of, of his circumstance, and then the lodge might vote to give him dues relief, like just as an example, okay? Um, it might be proper for the Masonic secretary to write down that we voted to give so-and-so dues relief, and it might not be proper to write down all of the private discussion inside of the lodge about the circumstances of why he needs that, okay? So when we develop intimacy with one another, there's a formula. Okay, and this works for friends, this works for lovers, 
This, this often works for children too. The process works like this. You got some distance from somebody and one or the other person takes a little bit of risk and self-discloses something. And what I mean by that is, you know, well, you know, I might say something as simple as, you know, actually when I was a little kid, I was really afraid of roller coasters, something along those lines. And it's like a trial balloon. You say something private about yourself and you self-disclose and the other person gets the opportunity to basically rat you out, to be completely untrustworthy or to be empathetic and trustworthy. So you are basically giving them a secret, maybe not a huge one, maybe not a super important one, and they are then proving themselves. When they then self-disclose back to you and they say, oh yeah, I was also afraid of all of these other things when I was a kid, okay? And then you remain trustworthy. There starts to become a silent understanding between people that we might call a kind of intimacy. So you disclose, they disclose, both remain trustworthy. That is literally how friendships and romantic relationships um, uh, um, evolve. And it can't happen without secrecy because if you had no secrets to give another person, you would not be able to develop close intimate relationships with other people. And so in your own lodge, you may know some brothers that you're closer to and some brothers that you keep a cool distance from. And if you think about what you have told those other people about yourself, you, you might see this pattern here. Um, this is also very helpful in another sense where if you want to be closer to another person or you want to develop more closeness with another brother or anybody else in your life, this is the process of how that happens. You don't just go blab all of your secrets and tell anybody everything that you want to tell them, but you basically test them, see how they react, see if they react with trustworthiness and empathy and see if they reciprocate. If they reciprocate, that's how this works. So in relationships, secrets also uh, serve another important um, purpose. We, 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 we talked about this as being a test. So whenever there's a secret, you have a teller and you have a keeper. So in masonry, we have some test secrets and we basically control our emotional and reputational risk in dealing with other people with these test secrets in my view. So emotions like relationships between brother matter a whole lot more than facts, like for example, a word or a grip. And I think that modes of recognition often function as trust tests between individuals. And so it took me a long time to kind of come to this realization, but a local past master to me said, said this to me in my, in my learning process. And it, and that's when it really started to click is he said, you know, look, it's not that the, the modes of recognition are so super important, but it basically boils down to if I can't trust you to keep a few simple words secret that don't even matter to anybody else outside of masonry, how on earth am I going to tell you about what's going on with my wife? And I think he had an excellent point there. Okay. So what if we looked at some of the Masonic modes of recognition as test secrets? This is your opportunity to prove that you understood what you heard in the EA obligation and to prove yourself worthy of some of the personal secrets that you might receive from other people as part of the third degree or to prove yourself unworthy. So I don't know if you guys have seen the Simpsons uh, Stonecutters episode, but it's hilarious. It's basically almost required viewing if you're a Mason. You can look up the Simpsons Stonecutters episode uh, on YouTube. They've got it there. Um, but you know, some of the modes of recognition, for example, would lose their value as designators if everybody knew what they were. And I re read a lot about how um, back during the, uh, the medieval ages, um, you could use modes of recognition as something like a resume. You know, if you were a traveling um, stonemason, you might go from what's now Germany to what's now France and showing up on the building site, you need a way of presenting your resume that you're qualified um, and modes of recognition might, ser might, might serve that. So there's this really positive benefit of a secret acting as a signal that you're a member or that you have a particular qualification. Uh, here too, I want to, this, this is a quote from the EA charge, the Entered Apprentice charge in Virginia. Um, keep sacred and inviolable the mysteries of the order as these are to distinguish you from the rest of the community and mark your consequence among Masons. I mean, I don't, I don't know how much clearer of a reference there could be to secrets serve a purpose as membership signaling. 
Uh, they mark your consequence and they distinguish you from the rest of the community. This is a really fun one. Okay, so put yourself in the mind of Albert Pike and you're back in the, in the 1800s. Uh, during this time, uh, social security was not a thing. Medicare and Medicaid was not a thing. The social safety net that now exists in Europe and the UK was also not a thing. And so we know from the history of our tradition that we provided orphanages, homes for widows, and also certain kinds of material relief to people. Um, that's not so much the case anymore, but it was part of how Freemasonry grew up, you might say. And then I came across this Albert Pike quote in the fourth degree, how profound a folly it would be to betray our secrets to those who, bound to us by no comp tie of common obligation, might, by obtaining them, call on us in their extremity. And so translating that into modern English, I think what this guy is saying is he's saying, at some level, we have social service obligations that we need to provide, and we need to be giving the benefits of, the, uh, of, those, um, of those labors to the people who deserve them. And if you betray our secrets, that's going to enable people who don't deserve them to gain access to our social security fund effectively. That would be a good reason to keep things secret is to prevent theft of resources. So, so far what we've got is um, secrecy is a kind of social cement that can bind people together because without it, um, it's harder to develop close relationships and intimacy between human beings. Second is that it permits you to undertake big social, economic, or spiritual projects together and to protect your plans for how it is that you're going to go about that. And third, it's all founded on mutual trust. So um, remember that every secret has a, uh, a, a giver and a keeper. Um, before we go on, um, any questions here or comments or thoughts on the, re the relationship side? Okay. So um, I, I, I'm pretty sure this audience is familiar, but esoteric simply re refers to things that are, are hidden rather than exoteric, things that are basically like on the surface for all to see. This quote is a little bit crazy. It comes from Carl Jung, a um, uh, psychologist who had studied a lot of um, uh, hermetics and all kinds of other topics. This one hits hard. Okay, let's, let's go through this one piece by piece because it's very important. So we never know the real secrets. Even the so-called esotericists don't know what they are. Esotericists, at least earlier, were supposed not to reveal their secrets, but the real secrets cannot be revealed nor is it possible to make an esoteric science out of them for the simple reason that they're not known. What are called esoteric secrets are mostly artificial secrets, not real ones. Man needs to have secrets, we've, we've established that, and since he has no notion of the real ones, he fakes them. He fakes them, we're gonna come back to that in a second. Um, but the real ones come to him out of the depths of the unconscious, and then he may reveal things which he ought really to have kept secret. Here again, we see the numinous character of reality in the background. It is not we who have secrets. It is the real secrets that have us. Okay. So, uh, Worshipful Douglas brought up at the, in, in the intro to this presentation, the idea of somebody coming to talk about Kabbalah. When you look at like the esoteric space, one of the things that's really striking about it is how many different families of approaches there are. There's, Hermetics, Kabbalah, there's even ritual magic. There's all kinds of other sub areas of Western esotericism that are linked to Freemasonry or related, but not necessarily the same thing. In all those different systems, when you look into it, okay, for example, with the Kabbalah, they have a, a tree of the Sephirot and where they have these various emanations of deity and how they map onto other things in the real world. All of them are kind of like correspondence systems where they're saying this thing in the real world is related to this other thing on a more esoteric plane. Like, for example, you might have something in an esoteric construct that refers to the goodness of God, for example. But they're all different. 
and they all have different traditions, but they're all kind of driving at the same thing. Okay. This is what, what I think Jung means when he says what are called esoteric secrets are mostly artificial secrets, not the real ones. So if we draw the Kabbalah, the tree of the Sephirot down on a piece of paper, okay, that's an artificial secret. It refers to something real, but it itself is not the real one. Okay. Um, I know that's a little bit abstract, but that's, that's the situation that we're in here. Okay. So if you're a newly raised master Mason, here's the crazy situation you find yourself in. The list of secrets is a secret. Okay. Can anybody present here? Like, I, I think we would generally all agree that, for example, the, the, the modes of recognition, certain steps, words, uh, handshakes and so forth. Those are all secrets as well as, for example, the text of the ritual. But um, does, does anybody here aware of a complete and total list of the secrets? Probably not. I'd love to see it if you are. Okay. I don't, um, David, I, I don't think it is articulated anywhere. I, almost, I don't think. It's almost like the landmarks, although some have made efforts to catalog the landmarks. It's sort mm -hmm. of like we all understand or, well, some of us understand and some of us nod our heads and say they understand. So, yes, I don't think there's a discrete list we can point to. If you put a gun to my head and say, what are the secrets? I would say, like you said, the modes of recognition and the, the, the text of the three initiation degrees. That's the literal secrets. I, I, I agree. Those, those are definitely in the list, but there's more in the list than that. And nobody knows exactly what. And um, I think the fact that there's not a list of them is a feature. It's not a problem. Okay. Um, we know what the themes and orbits of the secrets are, but there can't be an exact list. And it's because of the, the Jung quote. I mean, if you did have a list, they, they would be the, 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 the fake ones, the, the, the surface ones, so to speak. Um, the, the modes of recognition and the ritual are definitely in those. So the themes and orbits of all of these secrets are things like virtue, personal growth, personal conduct, and deity. And so when we go into the topic of esoteric secrecy, the question is, all right, if you don't even know what the list is, how are you going to, I mean, how, how are you going to get told the secrets? Like, how are you going to uncover the secrets? And so the answer is really simple and it's action and experience. And so in my view, the reason that the ritual is important is because it's the experiential learning process um, by which you gain access to some of them, not all of them. Okay, so notice about Masonic ritual that it is something that you do. It's not something that you're told, like your physical participation in the ritual is important. Okay, you must actually take physical actions. All right. So in this way, we think about from the esoteric perspective that secrets are not always information communicated. Like I was really scared of roller coasters when I was a little boy. All right. And they're not information communicated like passwords, but they are actually experiences earned. Okay. And so in the EA lecture, when you look at the structure of that lecture, it is literally just an account of what you did that entitled you to enter and everything else that happened after that. All right. So this issue of experience can't be separated from esoteric secrecy. Um, in turn, this is why I think a lot of brothers that I know get so bent out of shape about things like one day conferrals is because they understand the importance of experiential learning and forums like one day conferrals tend to remove that experience from a brother. So um, in, in this sense, like when we're talking about the quote, real secrets, whatever that means to you, in Carl Jung's view, it's not even possible for them to be revealed. And, and early on in my journey, people told me this too, is it's like, well, you don't have to worry about divulging the secrets of Freemasonry because you're not even capable. Um, you could try to stop somebody on the street and blab all of your secrets, but it wouldn't work. It, it wouldn't make sense. Okay. So quick story about this is like when I was 16 years old, this is a true story. Uh, my parents told me you shouldn't smoke. It's really bad for you. It's going to kill you. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I started smoking because it was cool and fun and relaxing. And some of my friends were doing it. And I smoked about a pack, pack and a half a day until I was in my early twenties. And uh, then I started to get bronchitis every single day. 
uh, sorry, every six weeks rather. And so the bronchitis would get so bad that it was literally painful to smoke. And so every six weeks or so, I had to quit smoking for about a week so that my body could recover so that I could start smoking again. And eventually I kind of wised up and, and, and I started to deeply understand what my parents had been telling me. Smoking is bad for you and it is going to harm you. Now, the words of what I understood were no different at 25 than they were at 16. But the experience made them register in a way that they, that they didn't before. And so as I'm getting older, you know, and I talk to older guys too, and it's like, if I had only known then what I know now, and you hear guys say this, like, oh, wow, I wish I could go back to being a teenager again, because of all the things I know now, I could have handled myself better. No, no, you couldn't have. You couldn't have handled yourself better at age 16, because if you could get into a time machine and you could tell your 16-year-old self all of the things that you now understand, your 16-year-old self wouldn't understand. It, it wouldn't make any sense. And so in this way, we can say that via experience, the older man knows secrets that the young man can't be told. You can put the old man on the rack. You can force him to write it down. You can force him record it into a podcast and still the young man can't hear. It. And this is something I've noticed in my own life and I've seen in younger brothers. This is what we're getting to with action and experience and the idea of an esoteric secret is like, what does it mean to know something when you're older that you could not have known when you were younger? That's what we're talking about here. So this ties to something that we call the initiatic experience. So there's this famous sociologist named Victor Turner, and he went out and this was the, he wasn't looking at masonry specifically, but he looked at initiation rites in all these different cultures all over the world. And he was like looking for commonalities between all of the different initiatic experiences. And they all boil down to kind of like three stages. If you're going to initiate somebody into a new identity, whether it is you're going to make them an EA or you're going to give a young man a bat mitzvah, a bar mitzvah, a bat mitzvah, or maybe it's a rite of passage in a foreign culture in Africa. The first thing that you do is you take the person and you separate them from the normal world. Now, I'm not going to go into Masonic ritual, but if you think about what goes on in the candidate prep room, I think you'll understand where we're coming from. Um, the second phase of an initiation in any kind of culture, any kind of initiation is a liminal phase where you're on the threshold, but you're not really quite there. Um, and uh, just because this is a recorded form, I'm not going to go into where that happens in the Masonic ritual, but um, use your imagination. It's in there. And then the third process is what they call reintegration, where now you've been stamped with a new identity of sorts. And you need to be accepted back into the group as something different than you were when you came in the door in the first place. And if you think in, in if we're talking about Virginia ritual, the second section of the entered apprentices uh, uh, um, degree is exactly this. When the person comes back in after the first section, you are reintegrating them. So as brilliant as Masonic ritual is, um, Freemasonry didn't invent rites of passage. Um, uh, one of the things that Victor Turner's work identified is that it's a basic human thing that pretty much all cultures and all times have done. Um, it's a facet of humanity like love or violence. Okay. And so when some of the esoteric researchers will go into like, for example, Freemasonry's connection to the ancient mysteries, this is one of those connections. I'm, I don't think that Freemasonry was like, derived from the ancient mysteries or had any straight line of lineage through, but you can see that some of the stuff that they were doing was basic and human, even if it was 2000 years ago in Greece. And some of the things that we're doing today are basic and human, no different because humans are still the same. So in this process of the initiatic experience, secrecy heightens the value of revelations, focuses and tunes people's mind in. So, um, there are points in time where we might say, okay, we're going to tell you some things and we need to make sure that you're really, really, really serious about this and that you really understand what's going on. And everybody is looking at you and you need to tune your mind in because what's happening is important. That's what we're talking about. Um, secrecy uh, also can lower intensity and provide relief. So that there, there are examples here 
dealing with people's personal diaries and how you might write down personal reflections and have them revealed only after your debt, only after your death. Um, secrecy finally is like a carrier of texture and variety. Remember, just imagine the, the chess game with no secrets. Okay. Communication or the initiatic experience with no secrets would be oppressively dull and lifeless, like a candidate who basically reads all the spoilers online and then comes in for their initiation. It's going to be a different experience. We recognize that. So uh, coming into our last section here, I want to call a section like a line of demarcation. And so uh, in the discourses, uh, by Epictetus, there's this short passage where he says, tell me your secrets. I say not a word for this is under my control, but I will fetter you. What is that you say, man? Fetter me? Your leg, my legs you will fetter, but my deliberate choice, not even Zeus has the power to overcome. So what I think Epictetus is after with this is by saying stuff that you have within your head, okay, torture, leg binding, anything else can't force you to give up stuff that's inside of your head. And so it is a line of demarcation between yourself and the outside world. It is something that can be your property, which ultimately nobody can, can take away from you. And that's important because of where we're going next. So it's said that um, uh, one of the objectives of a lot of mystery schools, initiatic traditions, different forms of Western esotericism is ultimately the idea of gnosis, which is just a Greek word that means knowledge. Whenever you hear gnosis, there's nothing crazy about it. We're just talking about knowledge or Masonic light, if you will. So in some of our traditions, the ultimate secret is basically the name of God or the Tetragrammaton. Uh, now the name, okay, if you could pronounce it, okay, uh, that might not necessarily be it. So back to Carl Jung's quote, um, there are these substitute secrets or fake secrets, all right? And a lot of folks consider the tetragrammaton or the name to be a symbol for understanding what the true nature of God is. And so you'll even see references to things like custodians of the true word, okay? Um, gnosis and this focus on gaining knowledge of deity is one of the few common threads that binds together the ancient mysteries. So a puzzle for me for years now has been, is masonry related to or derived from the ancient mysteries? And I think for, for all intents and purposes, historically, where I get to is the answer is hard no. Uh, it's not related to uh, the, the ancient mysteries. But in this way, they are actually the same. It's the thread that you pull through. They were all about gnosis. They were all about initiatic experiences. And they all dealt with and communicated and taught esoteric secrets. So one model in a lot of different religion and esoterics about, about deity is that you have to have faith. It's not your job to understand. It's not your job to know or to be able to explain. It's your job to be faithful. Um, this idea of gnosis kind of goes the other way and says the way that you real realize deity is by becoming sort of unified with, with the nature of what it is. Um, uh, it's, it's not just by blindly believing. Okay. And so knowledge of deity can be uh, um, gained and can be learned and can be experienced. And that if you did any of those things, the result would be one of these esoteric secrets that we're talking about that you couldn't communicate even if we put you on the rack and tortured you, okay? Um, secrets can also be thought of as the things that conceal gnosis. Um, so the reason that we want to qualify people into knowing certain things is that um, uh, these experiences, for example, initiatic experiences or the, the entered apprentice degree qualify people to take part in secrets, that is to, to participate in them by union, rather than just to learn them as academic book knowledge or to know them um, just as like a fact on paper. I mean, hey, when I was 16, year old, 16 years old, I knew as a fact on paper that smoking was bad for me and that it would harm my body. I mean, I knew it, but I didn't know it, if you know what I'm saying. And ritual is how these things are communicated via experiences. This goes back so far. I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of years. Uh, from the mysteries of Isis, there's this particular prayer uh, to the god Isis. But a pious, though poor worshiper, 
I, I shall essay to do all within my power, thy divine countenance and most holy deity I shall guard and keep forever secret, forever hidden in the secret place of my heart. So this person, you know, way back when, feels as though they are gaining some knowledge of deity and whatever they are gaining in their knowledge of deity uh, has to be guarded and kept secret because there is this line of demarcation. It is a kind of private communication from deity to the individual and it isn't for anyone else. Uh, even if you tried to give it away, you wouldn't be able to. And that is uh, about it. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm just messing up my slide advance. We're, we're shortly done. So just to round things up and kind of get to some final thoughts, uh, you have to have secrecy in order to protect and grow your personal identity. That includes your thoughts, your, ans your plans, your actions and property. You literally can't be free without secrecy. Um, secrets are extremely powerful like fire because they can modify other people's emotional responses. And if you don't believe that, then try to elope without telling your parents and see how they feel about it in six months. Secrets modify people's responses. But they also serve this really powerful um, function to build trust and intimacy between people, as well as to keep polite society functioning. So liminal rituals, and by liminal rituals, I mean things like the entered apprentices degree, help people cope with changes around them and gain certain elements of gnosis. We're never going to have a list of the secrets. Um, you can't write them down. It's just, I, I'm convinced that it's not possible. Um, and the way that you gain access to them is by actually doing work, um, not by reading. And so um, I've met a couple of esoteric types before where they've read every single book uh, um, on the shelf about Kabbalah and they're extremely brilliant about the academic aspects of symbol manipulation and what this symbol means and how this corresponds to that and the history of what this rabbi thought and like all of that um, academic book learning. And I don't mean in any way to discount the value of the academic book, wording, book work. Um, I've done plenty of that myself, but at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to get actual gnosis or secrets about deity by reading books. So finally, like, Secrecy can be thought of as a line of demarcation between man and deity or a form of private communication between the two. And lastly, um, you know, so at the very beginning of this presentation, I was thinking secrecy is super negative and society is against it and it violates all of these norms and so on. Um, is it possible that secrecy is positive? Well, it's kind of both. Um, it's like a kind of fire. So you can use fire to bring light or, and warmth, or you can use it to destroy entire cities. And humanity does both of those with secrecy regularly. So uh, this is my final thought. Um, I'm not going to answer the question whether it's positive or negative, because if you've heard me, it's kind of both. It's up to you on how to use it. And so uh, this poem is one of my favorites of all time. Um, and it, it, it's intended to drive home the point um, that it's really what you do with it. This is kind of takes us interestingly full circle because the discussion before the presentation dealt with what you're going to get out of masonry is going to depend on what you put into it. And the second stanza here is no matter who you are, you get the same set of rules, you get a body, and you get some tools and, and affordances to work with. And you need to figure out whether you're going to make out of that a stumbling block or a stepping stone. And um, that's where I came to in the end of this with secrecy is uh, it's to be used sparingly and it can be used for very positive things if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, David. Any questions or comments from the group? Uh, one comment. Um, I'm slowly reading uh, Ray Dinslow's Masonic Journey. It's the two-volume work that's um, done by the, uh, I think it was the Missouri Lodge of Research. And um, uh, if you join the Lodge of Research, I think you can, you can buy the... Uh, 
the volumes. I got mine on Kindle, so it's available to everybody on Kindle. It's a, like I said, it's in two volumes, and I'm probably a little over halfway through with it. But um, there are parts of it that he did not want revealed until after that person died. And parts of it, of course, after he died. But, uh, you know, there are parts that they uh, kept, he kept secret uh, until those people had passed. Uh, and there's things that uh, they, in compiling the book, that the estate decided not to reveal. Uh, um, for one reason or another. So um, that was uh, my experience with, uh, and, and as you read it, you can, you can see, see the reasons. And you can also see the reasons why he will want others to know the interaction with certain people because it's a good lesson for us. So um, that's my experience with secrets in the Masonic realm. <laughs> Yeah, he may have had many good reasons why he would want to keep certain things secret dealing with. Imagine that you're at the end of your life and you're writing your memoirs. Many of the impactful things that may have happened to you deal with secrets that other people told you. They impacted you. They were part of your life journey. Should you write other people's secrets into your memoirs? Well, that's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a lot of reasons why a person would conceal the reasons why they did things. Uh, I wanted to bring up something in the chat that um, someone asked if Carl, Carl Jung was a Mason. And then another brother said, no, he wasn't. And another brother said, yes, he was. So apparently Carl Jung was grandmaster of the Swiss Grand Lodge. Is that correct, Brother Hughes? And I wish we could have had this discussion. I believe he was, yes. Okay, very interesting. Yes, yes. Uh, there is stuff that comes in. The trouble with the chat, I'm trying to think forward for, because um, not everyone is looking at the chat. And, of course, if you're watching this video on YouTube later, you're not going to see anything that's in the chat. So if something interesting comes across on the chat, I want to bring it up. Uh, I would ask if you have questions, you can go ahead and bring it up during the discussion mm -hmm. And that might actually make it more interesting rather than have it in the chat. But I see why some people didn't want to be rude and they simply, they talked about it here. Um, but I was not aware that you was a Mason. Apparently he was. So just one more interesting thing. <laughs> I was just checking this out in the background. It, it appears that he was, yes. yes. He okay. was the rector of Basel University, an ardent Freemason, and became the grandmaster of the Swiss Lodge and published all throughout his life. I, I wasn't aware that he was a Freemason, but I knew that he had written a lot about topics uh, related around and through. And I wanted to bring up something, David, about, uh, I was looking up something when you're talking about, um, you said that you said that basically there are, I forget the exact word. You said there are, there are fake secrets and there are real secrets. Is that the correct term? Yes. Uh, and that, he, yeah. As soon as you, basically, as soon as you write a real secret down, it becomes a fake secret, is kind of what he said. If you could write it down, it's a fake secret. If you can't, it's a real secret. It made me think of the um, uncertainty principle by Werner Heisenberg, that the act of measurement disturbs the object measured. So yeah. as soon as you write down what a secret is, it's no longer a real secret. It's now it goes in the pile with the fake ones. Yeah, so, well, the, the, there, there's also the just the, the, the limitations of writing in human language fundamentally. So um, there's some cool math stuff online about mathematical concepts that are defined such that like a number can be so large that it's not writable. It's not even writable with exponentiation and so on. Mm -hmm. So you can have these pure concepts that just don't translate into language. All right. Um, and so uh, language can kind of sort of roughly capture whatever it is that we're talking about. So no matter how odd an animal or a scene or a situation might be, I can use English to describe it to you, but I'm always going to be losing something. I'm not transmitting the pure mental image that you have inside of your head. I'm getting kind of sort of close enough. So basically, right. like whenever you turn something into human language, you're going to be losing information about it. This is true. Okay, so on, on a complete, um, 
reverence, uh, ref, uh, what I call a sub-reference and, and, and going off on a tangent here. I don't know how many of you watched the show Battlestar Galactica, the remake. Um, maybe some of y'all are old enough like me to have seen the original, but one of the main Cylons and the Cylons have human form. Okay. He's bitching to his mother, the other Cylon who created him and he was given human form and it's a brilliant little speech where really he gives. And, um, he, he says, basically, you know, I want to smell dark matter. I want to hear, um, radiation and, and I want to see ultraviolet rays. And he describes, the limitations because instead of making him out of metal like all the other cylons they were made to look like humans so they could experience what life is like as a human and he's basically very upset about this because he wants to stand there and watch a star being born and he can only perceive things through the limitations of human eyes and ears and at the end this is relates to your point he says I'm so frustrated in that I am limited in forcing to take this concept and use my mouth to enunciate it in human words. And I can't even begin to communicate what it is I'm feeling because I'm forced, I'm limited in having to say it in words. And I was like, brilliant. I mean, it was just one little scene in the whole show, but it always stuck with me. It's like, that's just brilliant. It's like this concept in his head and he's, truly can't communicate what he's really feeling and it's one more limitation that they put on him as making him human and he's like he's even pissed that i can't say it (laughs) hasn't everybody felt that at one point or another that you wanted to kind of express something but you didn't have the right words to do it i mean the more abstract and important the information becomes the more that's going to be the case exactly and it also works with um like Translating, where I had a big discussion with uh, someone about, I think it was John Nagy on online here about uh, Schadenfreude, and we were talking about something, and he referred to it as Schadenfreude, which is a German word. There is no English translation. Schadenfreude is a sort of perverse delight in someone else's suffering. So I don't like David, and David is going through a hard time. And I'm experiencing my own little joy that David's life yeah. sucks right now. And it's, it's shaded for it. I'm enjoying it. But he brought it up as, because we were talking about people that were intentionally doing something to other people. And I disagreed with him. I said, well, it's not shaded for it. I had to go and look it up. As it turns out, I actually was correct. Because he was using something referring to shaded for it where people were intentionally harming other people. Schadenfreude is, I'm not making David's life suck, but I see that David's life sucks and I'm enjoying it. I'm getting perverse pleasure, but I was not the cause of it. And my, yeah, it's, my difference it's usually, with John was that sadism. When you can actually, if I'm causing you to be harmed, David, and I'm enjoying it, that sadism, because I took part in making it happen. Schadenfreude is where I'm just yeah. enjoying it happening without having the cause. But I, I find that stuff to like, it comes up the most often where people where it's kind of like a revenge thing. So imagine that somebody like really cuts you off in traffic and then you see them pull over to the side of the road, they get out of their car and then they stumble on the curb and fall on their face. Yes. You're probably yeah. going to laugh exactly. because you're mad that they cut <laughs> you off in traffic. Right. All right. That's where you're laughing at their misfortune. Like they, they might've hurt themselves. Right. But you don't yes. care. You're laughing like a fool because you're right. angry at them. Right. But the, the point being that Shaden Freud does not have an exact translation. in Eng- There is not an English word to correspond. So even among our written languages, there are words in certain languages that I can read it. And I, if I don't speak German, I speak very little German, but I don't really understand it. But some things like you, you can only appreciate Shakespeare in the original Klingon. You have to hear it in the original language. So now I made a star. I got to make a Star Wars reference. Now. I mean, Star Trek and BSG. Um, you don't really appreciate the meaning of something if you don't read it in the original language. You're just hearing the English version of something that was written in German or Klingon, what have you. So you're right. The more we are distanced from the abstract, the less precise are capturing what the, in what the actual feeling, what the, uh, what the feeling was about. So, so anyway, any other comments from anyone? It looks like Michael's talking but he's muted.
Let me just give an example of this because um, I think I've told you an example. I have a BFA in art history and my, my, my specialty was film study. And you take, a, let's just take a book like Dracula or Tarzan, which has been re remade many times. It's the same basic material, but each version of the film says more about the, the year in which it was made than the, you know, than this, you know, than the book itself. Like if you look at the 1931 Dracula, it's so different from Christopher Lee's from 58 or Frank Langella's from 1979. But each of those films, while it's the same source material, reflects amazingly about the year in which it was made. Right and sure. it's, a, it's a feeling. It's the, uh, sometimes it's, it's just, I can always, when I, when, if you were to turn on a movie, there's something about the, the, the and as David would say, esotericness of it, the, the, the things that you can't always put into words, but it's a feel of something that you can always tell because that was the feeling of the, it was the zeitgeist of the year in which it was made comes through. Uh, rather, you know, even though the source material is, is, is so different. It's just like seeing a degree in one lodge is different from seeing it in another lodge because each lodge has its, you know, has a different group of people performing it. It's the same words, but it can have a completely different feel to it. Right. And, and that's not, that's, that's almost a subconscious thing when referring to film. It's not intentional, but it's sort of they're drawing on the, you said the zeitgeist of the, of, of the day. Um, another mm -hmm. example I'll give you is the original Star Trek, where it was presented as we are several hundred years in the future, and we are so advanced from mankind and look where we are, look how far we've come. And then when you watch the show, it's like, okay, there's girls on the ship. They're all in miniskirts. They're all secretaries and receptionists and nurses. We're an enlightened society 300 years in the future. But the original Star Trek pretty much reflected 1960s mindset <laughs> about exactly. women, at least. And Kirk was a hound dog. He was hitting on every woman left and right. And that he was the hero of the show. So even later, Star Trek made more of an effort, I think, to reflect more modern views of, of, of women, at least. But I found that funny going back and watching the show. It's like, you're 300 years in the future. And, um, you know, women are still like sex objects. Even, <laughs> But again, that was, the sh that was the era in which the show was made. So exactly. it was normal. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, any other comments or questions for Brother David? David, I didn't know you were even working uh, on this. I, I'm very impressed. As these, we're fellow travelers, and I'm very, very impressed with the flow of the things, the the narration, the the visuals, uh, just and the research. How it all came together so well. Very great job. I, I will say, I, I do appreciate the subject, and it was great that you delved into it. But yeah, just from a performance and research standpoint, you did an outstanding job, and I really enjoyed it. You you put a lot of thought into it, and you're, we have a number of papers on here from different people. Sometimes they're more polished than others, I'll say, to be charitable. They all have good content. Everything, everything we've ever had here is really good content and makes you think, but some are more polished and better presented than others. Yours really was well well done. And I could see there was a lot of thought and a lot of intellect you put behind it and tying things together. So I did appreciate that. So I'm looking forward to more from you in the future. So very good. Nice well, job. I'm doing this whole series for the Scottish Rite. And I think oh, it's, it's right now it's taking me about two months per paper. But I, oh, wow. I recently finished the fifth degree one. And I'm probably going to be starting on the sixth degree soon. Now that this is for the College of Consistory in Guthrie, Oklahoma, is that correct? Yeah, that's that's right. They they have a program um, which is basically opt in education for Scottish Rite Masons, where mm -hmm. you write them, and it's it's all correspondence, and uh, they basically send you a list. You're going to go through every degree sequentially. That's how it works for everybody. Um, uh, and you get a list of prompts for whatever degree you're on. And so uh, about the fourth degree, I, ha I could choose between like 15 different facets of it that I wanted to tackle, but wow. I was interested in secrecy and that was one of the options. So I'm like, I'm picking that one. 
And then you, you write a paper on it and you submit it. And then they have kind of like a college of adepts that grades you and then passes you so that you then go do the next paper about the next degree. I've completed the fifth and I'm going on to the sixth. So I'm still like relatively speaking, I'm at the very beginning of the process. And they have a private members area where for people who have submitted papers, you can see everybody else's submissions about the degrees. Um, but um, on, on the note of relationship secrecy, we don't share those papers because it's for the folks who are in the College of the Consistory. Right. So this is something that the, the Valley of Guthrie offers. Yeah, that's right. And it's that's a, right. Is it any Scottish Rite Mason? I mean, is it just Southern yeah. jurisdiction? Yeah, yeah. If you're, okay. if you're a Scottish Rite Mason in good standing and you okay. look up the Guthrie College of the Consistory, with the very first thing that they do is they send you like a, a very long multiple choice quiz that deals with um, basically a whole lot of Blue Lodge symbolism uh, um, and a lot of content out of uh, Albert Pike's book, Esoterica. Mm -hmm. And honestly, you remember how we were talking about secrets as sort of like uh, um, uh, um, proving worthiness or gating criteria? Um, I haven't talked to the brothers who put together this program about why they have this long multiple choice test, but I think that they're basically making you prove that you know what you're talking about, about basic blue lodge symbolism before you go into the deep end of Scottish right degrees. Mm -hmm. And so they make you do that before you get your first set of prompts on the, on the fourth degree. Or, or at least that you're, you're serious about it and you're not just yeah, exactly. to get a piece of paper. And, Cause yeah, if, I would think that would put off some people's like, Oh, that's too hard. Well, I mean, that's just it, right? <laughs> if, if, if you can't do a multiple choice exam about stuff that you've definitely already been through, you're probably not going to make it through the process of researching and writing a paper, you know? Well, um, that so that's my assumption. I'm not exactly sure that that's why they do it, but that's, that's the process. You just, you literally write them an email or you send them a paper letter and they'll hook you up. I've got um, uh, a bunch of materials right here um, from the Scottish Rite. Uh, about about this and um, they actually send you some other papers that are written by a Scottish Rite Mason by the name of um, Jim Tresner who a lot of people yep. have heard of oh yeah and um, uh, I'm wondering if I can find this in here quickly without wasting you guys time there I have a copy of a Tresner paper in here that was really good yep. um, I don't know if it's available online or not uh, but it is let's see Mailing instructions. Where's the Tresner? Did you hear about this from your local valley or is this something you yeah. found on your Yeah, own? Okay. Um, I found about it from my local valley. Um, okay. So the paper is called A Forward on Truth and Fact by Jim Tresner. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, Brother Douglas, you would love this because yeah. it, it, it it's basically about um, – about the difference between truth and fact and how that applies to Masonic research. So what I think they're trying to, trying to caution you about is, you know, a fact is that water boils at a hundred degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. um, um, or, uh, okay. If we think about allegory, imagine the story of the tortoise and the hare, like the Aesop fable. Okay. So you got this hare who's really full of himself and he's, going to challenge the tortoise to a race and he just knows he's going to blow the doors off of this guy right and because he's a fast rabbit and the tortoise just like barely even moves right okay right. um and you know he falls asleep by the tree the tortoise ends up winning everybody knows that story okay i think what tresner is really talking about in that paper is it's like the, the facts are that the tortoise won the race but that's not the truth of the story <laughs> you know what i'm saying right. the facts are that that tortoises and hares can't even speak okay but if you look at that story and you're too obsessed with the facts you're going to miss the truth of the story right okay <laughs> and you can approach masonic research on either angle so like there's certain elements of masonic research like the history of the formation of the premier grand lodge that are entirely factual you know it happened on certain days you know elias ashmole might have been the first recorded speculative mason all of those good all those good facts and then there's truth. And so basically the paper is just about don't get those two twisted up. Interesting. Well, I want to say I haven't heard of this college before you mentioned it as being the reason for your paper. And I, I'm grateful that it exists because it gave us your talk, which is very well, well written and well presented and it made a good presentation here. Um, but I think it's great that because I know of the uh, Master Craftsman program, which is, of course, at the Supreme Council level for anyone in the Southern jurisdiction, 
I don't know if yep. they, they may offer it. I think you have to be a Southern jurisdiction Mason to sign up for it. I don't know. But is it available at any Scottish Rite Mason and is very in depth? We're starting a, um, we started a, uh, like a study group here um, in my local valley here. Oh, and let me show my shirt off. Today I wore my Norfolk Valley Scottish Rite shirt, uh, <laughs> flying the color since it's a Scottish Rite kind of day. Um, <clears throat> but we, uh, we just started this study program. Uh, West Latchford's in charge of it. And um, we're meeting, I think, once a month. We just started to, uh, to kind of work on the Master Craftsman together as a group and help people work on it. But it's yep. very involved. But that's one that gets a lot of press. A lot of people know about it. But this is a totally different thing that I've never even heard yeah. about. And so it's very intense. <laughs> so I've been through the Master Craftsman process, okay. too. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like at the end of the day, it's a bunch of uh, um, multiple choice mm -hmm. tests where they focus your reading and they say, this is where you need to go look. And these are the things that you need to learn. And then the multiple choice test is kind of like a learning check, right? Yep. Um, uh, so, but, but what the thing with the master craftsman program is that it's very directed is they say, this is what you need to learn next, then this, then this. And so, right. you know, like there's a whole section on like the symbolism of the square and compasses and, you know, what, what goes into that. And like a lot of that stuff, I think too, uh, depended on, uh, uh, esoterica, I think, mm -hmm. uh, th that comes up a lot in the master craftsman, uh, program, but, uh, the college of the consistory is all off-roading. There's no path. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, it's just basically like the topic for the next thing that you're going to do is going to be, let's say the fifth degree of, of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Um, here is a list of 15 prompts that you could follow, pick whatever you want, do whatever you want. Let us know when you're done. And it takes, like I said, it takes like a couple of months per, <laughs> right? Very I mean, cause I got, I got a job and a wife and kids, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, it's something I definitely be interested in. And if you yeah. don't mind, if you're in our Facebook group, uh, put some links about it, talk about it a bit and let's make it sure. readily available to people. I think that would be great. Um, sure. Oh, I wanted to say hi to Brother McQuery, who joined us late. I think he came in after the program was over, but this will be available on YouTube. But good to have you with us, Mike. <laughs> uh, we dropped several brothers, so I need to – I think that's – good to have you with us, brother. Um, and uh, we have – I do want to cover our upcoming things and all that. I do want to say this, though. Um, I'll give everyone a chance to say – Anything they want to close out, I, I think we've covered all the questions people had. Um, this is a work in progress, and I know I keep saying this, and this this, this unstated meeting thing is very self-referential. I talk about what it is all the time, and I hope that's not boring people, but honestly, I feel like I've – it's almost like I've stumbled across something, and I'm still figuring out what it is, so I'm going to talk about it as I go. So maybe along the way, we'll look back and I'll go back and watch these and like, okay, I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew I was on the right track, but I really had no idea where I was going. You know what I mean? But just something about it, I, I'm sticking with it. This was done because we couldn't meet in person because of COVID, but it's given me an opportunity to offer Masonic education to brothers all around the world, literally all around the world, much more so than just in Virginia. And I don't have a, a, a set path of where I'm going with this. I just know that there are a lot of things in masonry that are out there that I've read about, that I've heard about, like alchemy and the Kabbalah and other things that I haven't explored it all on my own, but I know other people have. And this is probably the most random um, setup you could imagine to pull all of this together. There is no set script that I'm going off of Obviously, in each meeting, there's no script, but there's no master plan that I'm going on. Like next week is going to be this week, this guy, and then it's going to be this guy, and I'm going to have this guy. It's literally random in that I'm approaching Masons online and saying, hey, you look like you could be a speaker. Come and give a talk. And I'm just pulling people in, and the time in which they come in and the subjects they bring are as random as you can possibly be. But along the way, I've managed to hit on so many really interesting topics and i think by the time i'm done we're going to have this catalog that's all going to be on youtube that anyone can go start at the beginning and just look for the unstated meetings playlist and just watch them all in order or whatever order you want 
And you're going to see this huge, huge arena of ideas about masonry that we're all going to explore. And sometimes we come back around to a topic and sometimes we may not touch on it again. And I'll throw an idea out here that I'm going to try and get someone for this. But I'm just impressed that it's just come together so well. And I think yours fits neatly into this. You're talking about something we haven't covered and you cover it in depth and it's just one more facet. So when the whole thing's done, I think I need to go back periodically and say, okay, let me go watch all of the previous episodes and kind of look at it and see what they all say. And at some point I may write a paper on what did I get out of this experience? What have we learned? Where these tie together? You know, does this paint a complete picture? This whole mosaic of independent, completely random research papers does it tell a story in and of itself? So it's fascinating to be to be the one driving, but also along for the ride because I really don't know where I'm going. So that's what's really cool about this. And it may evolve into something completely different. I may have completely different production values two years from now. I might laugh and say, look at this amateur stuff. I remember that camera. I paid 150 bucks for that camera, you know, to capture this. And wow, look where we are now. I'm in a studio. Who knows? But I, I don't know where it's going. And that's the fun part. And so that's why I talk about it along the way. So hopefully it becomes a really big thing someday. And somebody goes through and watches all these and, and sees my evolution as your host, figuring out where the hell it's going. Who knows? <laughs> but I think. Well, look, they, look, um, worshipful Douglas, well, yeah. brother Douglas, I, I appreciate the leadership that you're showing by doing this in the first place. There's some efforts in central Virginia where we're trying to get a little bit more organized the same. And, um, uh, um, within my lodge, I kind of act as uh, uh, somebody who helps coordinate our philosophy discussion group and, and, and some other things. And I intend to advertise whatever I see going on in Masonic education. Um, because, you know, we always have that problem of, oh, I can't make Saturday morning or I can't make Thursday evening or whatever the case may be. But you want to basically have like a broad variety of options for people at different times and different kinds of venues across an area so that there's always something for everybody, A, and so that over time we start to knit, to gr knit together the group of brothers regionally um, who share these kinds of interests. So I, I really appreciate you putting together this venue. I got a lot of value out of the Swedish masonry presentation last time. And even if I haven't been on some of the others, I've seen them on YouTube. Oh, good. I'm glad someone's watching them. I, I, I like to think I'm not wasting my time uh, I, it's not, believe me, it's not a huge effort. It's pretty much just queuing up, taking a PowerPoint, changing the title and weaving it together and simply choosing a starting point and an ending point of the recording. I don't have a huge amount of production value in, in editing. If I really wanted to, I could go through, take out the gaps, tighten it up, make it more of a formal published thing. Um, the only thing I wish I could change is like your talk was well over an hour and that was great. We all enjoyed it. I don't know that people are going to watch an hour and a half, two hour YouTube video. Some people do. It's been said to me by a brother at Virginia Research that we should have like 20 minute, 15 to 20 minute talks to draw people in because people will watch those. I may have to just film those separately, bring people in and have them give a, a, a shorter talk just to get a shorter video to draw in more people. I don't know. But right now we're long form YouTube and we're kind of a rarity <laughs> But I'd like to I'd like to talk to you about that offline some point sure, in, in another venue because th there's a lot of people doing a lot of different formats and I think that there's value to every single format that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes it attracts different crews, but having um, uh, having having a range of different formats available lets people choose and lets there be space for longer discussions if need be. Um, it, it's just, th th there's a lot of pros and cons and yeah. I think you're doing awesome. You just keep doing right. what you're doing. You don't have to uh, adapt the format to, to, to try to, you know, get max participation. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it, what I'm doing works for what it is. I, me personally, I think I'd rather sit in a, I'd find it easier to sit in a, um, in a zoom meeting for two hours and be part of the discussion than to sit and watch a two hour recording of it later. That's just me. But if I missed one, I'd wanna go back and watch it. I have a 
a score of Saper all day videos. I watched the first one that I attended and I wanted to go back and finish it. And I haven't, I want to go back and watch all these other ones that are out there. And I know they're on YouTube. I haven't gone out and watched them. So, and you know, it, it, it's, that's just me. So I'm hoping there's an audience for what I'm doing. Even if it's a small audience, it's still an audience. And if there were only yes. three of us meeting, at least I'm reaching somebody and making somebody's life a little. So, more. you know, for, for what it's worth, like part of my job involves making content online. Okay. And uh, just about software and stuff. But um, when you make content online, like let's say a YouTube video, um, you got to be careful because like a lot of times you're looking for some initial reception. You're going to publish this video and then 48 hours later, it's going to have like six or seven views or something like that. Okay. Yep. But the way the internet works is that search engines start to index these things. And, yeah. you know, the descriptions and the titles are important. And if the video is good and the content is good and people are interested in it, you start to see your audience coming over the next six months. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times if I write something about a technical topic online, uh, five days later, nobody's really seen it. Why did I waste my time? Okay. Yeah. But then I come back six months later and I find that it has 15,000 hits. Yeah. And the reason is that Google found it. And all those people who came and saw it after the fact were people driven there by Google because Google knew it was good. You know? Yeah. Okay. And so uh, uh, we, we are, when you record stuff and you put it on YouTube, you are time traveling. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, true. Hello to the Masonic researchers of 2023 who found this video. Right. All right. That, I mean, that's, that's partly what's happening. That's true. Yes. I don't want to discuss this in depth, but I don't want to take a minute more time right now, but I, I, we yeah, can talk yeah. later. Um, okay. Sure. I do need to, uh, again, thank you. I do want to give our upcoming, I, I try to do this for everybody bails, but we still have most of us still here. Um, Saturday, May 21st, and I certainly hope, David, you will join us since you live in town, so you have no excuse. But Saturday, May 21st, we're meeting in person at Virginia Research Lodge on at Babcock um, Sonic Temple in uh, Highland Springs, and that's going to be at 10 a.m., and that's going to be our, pres our presenter will be Wes Latchford, who's also a member of my Scottish Rite, who is Master of Linhaven Lodge this year, and I think Atlantic Lodge at the same time. Uh, he will be talking on the Tyler sword and he will be bringing visual aids. So yes, there will be sharp implements that you can all look at uh, and possibly touch. I don't know what is, how that works, but yes, Michael's excited. Yes. We're going to have actual swords and Chris's and daggers. I love that. My, my name is also a name for a sharp, for a twisted knife. It's kind of cool, but we will have swords and daggers and blades and implements of destruction that he'll be showing off and talk about the Tyler sword. And there'll be a wonderful uh, lunch served afterwards. So please, if you're in the Richmond area or you can be in the Richmond area, join us. That's the 21st. So, of course, that changes our schedule because I do these every two weeks. I move the next Zoom meeting forward a week. And that'll be Saturday, May 28th. And that is the Hidden Kabbalah in the offices of the Blue Lodge. And Brother Roy Bradburn is our guest speaker. And that's Saturday, May 28th at again, 10 a.m., and that's going to be online. So two weeks from now, um, we'll be, there we go. <laughs> yes, the Illuminati is confirmed. Uh, two weeks from now, meeting in person in Richmond, the Tyler Sword. Three weeks from today, the Hidden Kabbalah in the offices of the Blue Lodge, and that will be our next online meeting. Expect to see this video on YouTube. Oh, I never say this. In, I forget to say this in the videos all the time. If you are watching this video, please like and subscribe even if it's several years from 2022 when we recorded this and by now i'm famous and you're stumbling across me as something i made 15 years ago please like and subscribe i still need to add new members um any brother has anything to offer before we close out uh i do uh please one is just a kind of a fun thing uh for those of us that watch oak island i didn't see the second episode last week but they have our Prior to the main episode, they have something called Digging Deeper. And uh, the one that was on Tuesday of this week really had tons of masonry in it. But it's always amusing when a non-mason uh, gets, uh, say, he goes, well, we're going to go into a lodge and show you something that relates to it. He goes, I'm going into a lodge? You know, and it's just, you know, the same thing happened on one of the, um, uh, there was another History Channel show. He goes, hey, I got us an, 
opportunity to, to visit the house of the temple, the home of the 33rd degrees. And it's like, yeah, you can go there Monday through Thursday every week. Anybody can go in there. But this guy, had like he had to have like practically, you know, but anyway, they went I to watch. that guy. I know exactly what you're talking about. I can't think of his name, but yes, he, uh, he managed to sneak his way into uh, the house of the temple. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I forget this. It'll come to me in a moment. It's yep. a guy that writes a lot of books, but anyway, uh, it was, it was funny because about a week before I, I was sitting there going, Exactly where is Oak Island and, you know, how would I get there if I was driving from Maine and it swept through, you know, you have to go through a big curve through to get to Nova Scotia. And I, I pulled up Nova Scotia and I said, knowing where Oak Island is, what would be the closest lodge? And I said, probably Chester Lodge number three, Grand Lodge of Nova Scotia. And that's exactly the lodge they went to on the show. So I, okay. I was happy to guess that. The second thing is just real quick. Uh, next week, I'm on vacation in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm going to, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was vi go by where Shepherd's Tavern is, which is where the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction formed. Cool. And uh, found a, there, and I'm going to, I'm going to link this to the um, Virginia Research uh, website, uh, Facebook page. I found a little thing called a Mason's Walking Tour of Charleston. And it actually, it's a short walking tour that shows you where the Masonic sites are in Charleston. So I'm going to follow that next week. It tells you easily how to get to the Shepherd's Tavern to see that, which is not there anymore. There are several plaques and it shows you where, you know, the grave sites of some of the founders of the Scottish Rite Southern jurisdiction where the old lodges were in Charleston. So I'm really excited about going on, you know, taking that little walking tour and I will be visiting Mariner Lodge number two in Charleston on Thursday night next week. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other, anything to offer before we close out? I, I do appreciate our regular visitors. Uh, Paul's becoming a regular. So is Rick. And of course, Michael, uh, brother a day, you are here. I don't think I've seen you on camera in a year, but you are here on a regular basis. So we appreciate you being here. I assume you're the same a day. There you are. I just need to confirm it's the same a day that we welcomed so long ago. This is this, as you can tell, is our Canadian brother, brother a day. <laughs> Good to have you with us, sir. If you want to unmute, say hello. I still can't hear you. You're unmuted, but I still can't hear you. Maybe your mic. Can you hear me now? There you are. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's great to be always be here because I always learn something new. Yes. So, you, yeah. You're one of our frequent flyers. Yeah. That's good to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do keep metrics, by the way. I do have, I don't release it, but I do have, uh, Zoom does provide a list of names. Of course, like David, well, I can't get to put his last name in, but that's okay. But I'll, I'll update it when I, <laughs> you can change your name for any Zoom meeting, by the way. Uh, I occasionally change mine, so I'll be like Dad Chris if I just came from a DMLA, uh Zoom meeting or something. So, but um, I get a record of names. If you bother to put your email in, I don't think Zoom requires it, but they offer it. Usually, mine's the only one with an email. Sometimes others, but I do pay attention to the names of people, and I so I want a count of how many attended each session. There you go, David. I'm renameable. Very good. Um, and now th that's probably going to put you as two. So I'll have to make sure when I clean up. But I do like the metrics it gives me. I, 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 I Sorry. Uh, yeah. I mean, you won't, you, you don't, I believe, see the names in um, when you, t when this is recorded, the names don't appear in YouTube, uh, in, the, in the recording. Um, but uh, I do have a record of it. I just like to know how many people attended. And I try to keep track of who's, re I recognize names and faces as we've been or been or, been here multiple times so i do kind of know we have frequent flyers um but we're a small group i mean we have our our high water mark was 60 i want to try and beat that again uh we generally have at least 10 for each one of these sessions and there's a handful of people who are here pretty regularly that if they weren't we wouldn't be meeting so i appreciate you all sticking out to the end um i think we had a high water mark of 11 or 12 today so so that was good okay it's 11:45. I think it's a pretty regularly running to two hours, no matter what I do. So it is what it is, uh, regardless of how long the speaker talked. <laughs> so um, I appreciate y'all coming out. I really do. We couldn't be, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have a regular group that attended. 
And I, I see that out of a group, I'd say, if I want to go do the math, I'd probably find about 20, 25 Masons who consistently are here. I never have the same people here every single week. Uh, some of you do appear kind of regularly, but if it wasn't for you guys, I want to be able to do this. So I appreciate y'all coming out. And uh, again, like and subscribe if you're watching me on YouTube. So uh, thank you all for joining us and we'll see you at an upcoming meeting.